Okay, good morning. Uh, my name is Gaurav Singh. I am product manager in OpenShift, and I have Darren with me. If you're oh, yes. Yourself. My name is Darren Dunn. I'm with IBM Research. Uh, I'm the computational patterning team lead for uh, Albany Nanotech, as well as uh, the Thomas J. Watson Research Center. So uh, I want to give you a view of what I'm hearing from my customers regarding batch and, and this type of activity. So I've talked to a lot of customers. These are predominant customers who comes to me around batch type of needs, right? So we talk to life science customer. They, they say we want to run genome si uh, uh, simulations. We talk to manufacturing customers. They want to do uh, computational fluid dynamics. Uh, we have very big uh, presence in FSI or financial sector. They want to run their characteristics analysis. And then we have this roads is Red Hat data science, and they have this use case of running uh, training jobs uh, um, on top of a batch system. So when I he hear uh, all this customer, everything boils down into three characteristics. They come and repeat, uh, you know, uh, the characteristics of the batch workload they're looking for. One is uh, asynchronous run. What they say is, we have this jobs. The jobs needs to run uh, asynchronously and complete to give me the result. These jobs are computational heavy. Uh, you know, require GPUs, uh, fast networks, fast network, fast storage, and these are massive scale. And since they are running on cloud, they need uh, some type of elasticity. Um, so. Listening to those customers, uh, we are trying to address few few problems either from uh, Red Hat or OpenShift side or from community side. One is job queue. Uh, is uh, I think the font is, font is very small, but I'll I'll talk through it. So, what what I've seen is uh, what customer is asking is, hey, these are my jobs. Uh, put it in a queue so uh, before it goes and scheduled, and that queue needs to be dynamic in the sense that. Um, the first job does not mean that it needs to execute first. I should be able to prioritize things um, uh, in the queue uh, so that you know, I'm, I'm, I want to make sure my high priority job is running all the time. Uh, I, I think community is working on something called queue. We have, uh, we uh, internally, OpenShift is working on something called MCAT, which is basically a app wrapper and dispatcher uh, for queuing. Then uh, a dynamic infrastructure, right? So we talk about queue. When a job comes into the queue, uh, what customer wants is um, a cluster is a spinner for them, right? These, these are very expensive infrastructure. They do not want it to spin uh, beforehand, like think about GPU nodes and all. Uh, these are expensive. So they want, whenever a job comes in the queue, they want the infrastructure to be spin. And when there's no job, just deprovisioning the whole infrastructure so that you know you do, there's no cost incurred. Second thing is um, they need to uh, have specialized uh, specialized hardware into the infrastructure. For example, GPUs, or you have a fast uh, uh, infrastructures uh, or fast network that you want to use in. And there's a way to enable that within the platform. So things like operators, we use operator in OpenShift, how to enable those operators within the infrastructure, looking at the job uh, characteristic, saying that, hey, this job needs GPUs, so the infrastructure needs a GPU. Go install the GPUs and get the ready infrastructure before the job can be uh, executed. Um, third thing is the gang scheduling. So what a customer says is, let's say I have 10 jobs, and infrastructure has capacity for five, uh, to run five jobs, make sure the jobs weighs, uh, wait until all the resources are available in, within the infrastructure, so all kind of all or nothing. Uh, run all jobs or nothing uh, uh, in, in the gang, gang fashion. Um, these are the trends that I'm seeing by talking to all these customers. So, I mean, all these customers use cloud uh, in one way or form for their application. Now they see benefit of it. They want to use the same benefit uh, uh, for their AI, ML, and HPC application. Uh, Multi-hardware architecture. So what I've seen is what customers are saying is, hey, uh, to save the uh, cost, I would be able to run my uh, 
run my management on the ARM architecture and uh, compute on x86, right? So need to have multi-architecture multi in there. Accelerators, we talk about, uh, they want to use GPUs, smart NICs, fast network, everything that clouds present today, uh, they want to leverage that into their, uh, uh, into their workload. Uh, containers, um, these guys, uh, now I've, I'm seeing a shift where customers, uh, you know, old HPC type of customer running on uh, uh, HPC workload on-prem, on a bare metal, they are transitioning uh, mostly uh, re-hosting uh, and looking forward to re-platforming their uh, HPC type of workload uh, into the containers. Uh, we, we talk about HPC a lot, but I've seen a very good use case coming on from AIML side, where AIML customers asking that, hey, I want this uh, uh, batch thing for to, to run my AIML jobs. So rather than HPC side, I'm seeing a lot of uh, requests coming from the AIML uh, side of, of the business. Uh, uh, not only AIML and HPC, but uh, I've seen some another uh, demand coming out from gaming, networking, and telco side that they want to uh, run on these uh, uh, on, 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 on a batch system. Uh, next is Darren. I, I, he's going to talk about how we're running uh, e, uh, uh, which one? E EDA workload. EDA workload on OpenShift or uh, Kubernetes. So I'll, I'll welcome Darren. Yeah. Sure. Okay. So for my part of the talk, I'm going to give you a little bit of background about the two worlds that I bridge. Um, I won't expect that anybody here knows the workload that I'm going to talk about. So I'm going to go into a little bit of detail so everybody understands. I will also. Uh, go into a little bit of detail about why we want to do Cloudburst. Uh, it's a very similar story to what everybody else wants to do and some of the benefits for us, particularly in semiconductor research and design for doing so. And then I'll go over some scaling results from our optical proximity correction workload using uh, Red Hat OpenShift container service in the IBM cloud. So semiconductor research and development. Um, my role is to span two worlds. I span uh, process development and research. I also span hybrid cloud. And my sole role is to bring these two worlds together so that we can be more efficient and leverage more opportunities. So when you think about doing semiconductor research and design, you could boil it down to three main things. You need to be able to design new circuits and chips. You need to be able to transfer what you've designed to photolithography masks. There's no way you can do anything without being able to transfer a design to wafer with lithography and other processing processes. Once you've done that, you're not done. You need to develop processes that are capable of actually processing the lithography pattern that you have, transferring it to a workable circuit on, on the wafer. Today, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna focus mostly on the transfer process. And I'm gonna talk about a project or process which involves what's called uh, retargeting, which is taking a design shape and actually changing it slightly so that we can actually print it, and then using um, a massively parallel, uh, um, embarrassingly parallel HVC workload called optical proximity correction to actually transfer the shapes uh, to uh, a photolithography mask, assemble it, and then write it to a, a photolithography mask and let the process development teams take over. So the tool set that I'm gonna talk about today, um, we, we use multiple tools. Today specifically, I'm gonna talk about a tool called Caliber, which is made by Siemens. Th these are commercial tools. Typically in engineering uh, design automation workflows, most of the primary tool sets are commercial. So one of the challenges that you have is taking a commercial tool that has been written for a more typical HPC Linux cluster environment, containerizing it, and then finding efficient ways to run it with orchestrated containers on OpenShift or uh, bare, uh, uh, more vanilla Kubernetes services. So when we talk about this, what we're really gonna be talking about is taking this application, 
This application is meant to manage the transfer through the photolithography mask from EUV light or uh, 193 to an actual wafer. When you break this process down, actually, um, it, it, it it's a, consists of many different tool flows. When we finish with design, what ends up happening is we get a database file format, either GDS2 or OASIS. Um, that file format contains a, a representation of, of design shapes that may contain upwards of 10 billion design shapes in a particular layer that we're going to transfer. As part of the process of figuring out ahead of time how we can take a design and print it on wafer, we have to go through several steps. One of them is called design for manufacturing. That's actually taking the ground rules that were established for the technology, figuring out what actually has to happen, what's printable, what's transferable, and if we need to change design rules, go ahead and do that. We then need to fill, use, use other shapes to fill the gaps in a design without impacting the performance of the design. And that's a, a tool and a, and a technology all to itself. Um, in many cases, what we're doing is we're decomposing a design into multiple colors and printing a color at the same time. And the reason for that is, is that as we get beyond the three nanometer node, five nanometer node, e you know, even starting at 10 nanometer, we can't print the entire design with a single color or a single exposure. We need to find ways to break it apart so that we can actually pattern what we need to do. Um, and then we talk about retargeting, where we take those shapes, we change them slightly so that we can actually print them. Um, we will put insert features through code called sub-resolution assist features. Those are required to help the lithography actually print, particularly intermediate to isolated shapes. And then we finally do uh, optical proximity correction, and we also verify that the shape that we've created will actually print on wafer using modeling um, to within a certain tolerance or expected uh, a variance. So in a nutshell, what is optical proximity correction? Um, you can think about this as an optimization problem. Prior to about the 90 nanometer technology node, you could actually take a drawn shape multiply it by a scaling factor and transfer it to a lithography mask, and you'd have a pretty good uh, probability of hitting the target for the design. And, and people would come up with some rules-based changes, but typically it was just a straight shot. Starting in 90 nanometer, that wasn't true. So if you look at this diagram, without OPC, that's the drawn shape. Um, you would bring it, you, you, you could think about the lithography process as a series of transforms. Um, one transform is to transform it to the mass, the other one is to expose it, and the other one is to etch it on wafer. What typically happened at 90 nanometer and beyond is the shape that we brought in as a design shape no longer was represented on, on the wafer. In fact, in some cases, some shapes wouldn't print at all. So there was a, a technique called optical proximity correction that was developed in which you bring in the design shape, you partition it into vertices and edges, you then expose that partition, partition shape um, or calculate what the aerial image would be, which is a very physical process, and you apply a, um, a, a, an empirical resist model to it to predict what the shape will print on wafer, and then you iterate um, until you either hit a fixed number of iterations or a, a cost function has been matched, and you then output that onto the uh, uh, the photolithography mass. So you end up with a lot of very complex serif shapes when you do this. So how, how is this represented from a compute process? So this is actually a two-part compute. You have a primary POF process that reads in the design layout, chops it up into tiles, and creates a queue or a heap. Once it's done with that, it spins up a bunch of remote workers. Uh, on, a, on a traditional Linux cluster, in our case, on an Opus Shift or a Kubernetes cluster. And then it starts parsing out work, tile by tile, to all of the workers. And it does this in a round robin fashion until, the work, until all of the tiles in the queue or the heap have been exhausted. Um, there's no need for the remotes or the worker processes to communicate with one another. So it's a very traditional hub and spoke um, uh, uh, process. So when we, when we talk about this in a traditional sense, 
and, and bursting to the cloud, what problem are we trying to solve? What we're really trying to do is expand our opportunity horizons to work on more and more projects. You can think about this as a triangle. We have three main resources that we're trying to optimize. One of them is compute. One of them are commercial licenses for the tools, and the other one is people, okay? The most sticky component that you have are people. It's not easy to expand a design team or an OPC team or a patterning team in short periods of time. The two things that you can expand are compute and licenses. So if you think about the semiconductor industry as a whole, there are more opportunities than capacity to take care of. But, and, and time to market is huge. So the faster that you can realize an opportunity, the more opportunities you can work on. So people spend a lot of time trying to figure out how do I maximize my opportunities? There's two ways that, that you could do this. Um, it, and one is to, is to increase your compute. The other one is to increase the number of licenses. And these two have to go concurrently, okay? So if we have a smaller uh, opportunity horizon that's re referenced in the, in the yellow, but we've got a lot of projects that we really want to explore, one of the best ways for us to do this is to burst to the cloud. But in order to do this, as was mentioned earlier, Designers and OPC engineers are not cloud engineers, and cloud engineers definitely are not designers or, or um, OPC engineers. There's a communication gap, and, and there are, there's an expectation gap. So if you could come up with a way that, that people are submitting jobs to a compute resource, and ex you can expand the, the compute license and people triangle to maximize your opportunities and, and deliver more in the same period of time. So our cloud burst strategy from the beginning is to use OPC or optical proximity correction as a proxy workload. We want to create the same on-prem infrastructure as we, as we would use in the cloud, and we want to target managed Kubernetes services. What that does is that lets us minimize the amount of configuration and tweaking that we do when we burst to the cloud and helps us realize this vision of same compute on-prem as we have uh, in the cloud. We also want to centralize license servers in the cloud to avoid splitting pools or having gaps in time from when we can leverage the cloud or not. And also develop uh, controllers and operators to make public cloud bursts with OpenShift transparent to the engineering teams. So this is a, a pictorial diagram of the type of infrastructure that we're talking about. On the upper left-hand side, we have our on-prem compute. We have interactive compute to set up jobs, to review results, to um, also change, uh, do, do job management. And we also have a number of OpenShift clusters that we maintain internally with shared uh, distributed file space. When we burst into the cloud, we target a, a, a service called ROX, which is Red Hat uh, OpenShift Kubernetes service in the IBM cloud. You know, if you're uh, used to um, AWS, you might think of this as ROSA. Um, and in the cloud, what we do is we build some, some compute nodes, the job management nodes, and we want to run across as many data centers in a cloud burst geography as we can so we can maximize our capacity, leverage autoscalers where we can so we can scale up and scale down to save costs, and centralize the license managers in, in a cloud geography that's accessible to all. One of the key things that you, you could do in almost any cloud is connect different regions via networking that exists solely in the cloud itself. So what we've done is within IBM Cloud, we use transit gateways to connect different geographies and maximize our ability to, to burst anywhere in the IBM Cloud from anywhere within IBM. So how does, how does our workflow work? Based on the description I gave you earlier, um, how do, how do we set this up in Kubernetes? And, and I'm sure people here could come up with many different ways to do this. Um, we chose, because of the nature of these tools, to try to mimic um, as much as we possibly could the way that these jobs run on a native Linux, bare metal Linux cluster. And the reason why we wanted to do this was twofold. One, it solves a problem of OPC engineers or design engineers understanding how their jobs are running. And two, with very you know, small tweaks to a, a, to a controller or a, an operator in Kubernetes, we can build in resilience to this workload by making sure that we leverage inherent capabilities in Kubernetes to keep 
worker nodes, for instance, up if they go down. Um, make sure that we can checkpoint and, and start and, and, and uh, restart jobs. Scale them down so that we can prioritize jobs. So what happens is we use Kubernetes job types. We have two, we have a primary job type, which um, so it starts initially. What it does is exactly what I talked about before. It reads in the layout, chops it up into tiles, and creates a queue. Once it's done, it then talks to a um, distributed controller um, that then spins up a number of workers. And when I talk about workers in this case, we're talking about running at fairly large scale. Uh, table stakes for an OPC run is typically between 8,000 pods and 16,000 pods. When you start talking to foundries, that's like a 20,000 pod run to, to, to make time, um, or to make most efficient use of time. So what we wanted to do was, was go out and say, for us to use this internally as research, we need to be able to get to 10,000 pods reliably. Let's go out, figure out how to assemble job flows like this, and demonstrate scaling from 1,000 to 10,000 pods. If we could do that in a fairly linear fashion, then we have confidence that we can go and do this at more scale. One of the other reasons for breaking this apart, uh, or breaking our, our job flows apart, is it also lets us address the differences be between running, let's say, four 2,500 pod runs and one 10,000 pod run on the same cluster, and also lets us address some of the shared file system issues that we have. So one of the things to keep in mind is for, for many of these tools and many HPC workloads, um, a shared high performance uh, file system is really key. All of the worker pods need to see the same file system, read and write to it and stat it that the primary pod sees. And they're gonna do this uh, with irregular patterns. So one of the ways that we've uh, made this, made our, our work happen here is to explore both open source high performance file systems like Ceph um, or, or internal file systems like GPFS or Spectrum Scale. Um, and we, what we tend to do is offer Ceph, um, Gluster, uh, or GPFS as persistent volume claims that are mounted by all of the pods in, in the run. Um, and we keep those static, and there's also another advantage to that is when we have to go back and debug logs, everybody can see the same thing. They can pick up the logs in the same place in whatever cloud environment we're talking about, and with asynchronous file management, we can bring it anywhere. So these jobs are heavily compute dependent, and they're heavily I.O. dependent, both at the network level and at the file system level. So, you know, one of the things that, that I get asked, I, I, I get some skeptical questions up front with new OPC engineers and new designers is, yeah, this is all great, it looks convenient, but is it gonna perform? How do I know that if I just you know, give you a Kubernetes job that I'm gonna get it in the time that I need to do it? So over the last two years or so, we've been, we've been looking at scaling. And OPC is, is embarrassingly parallel. It should scale fairly linearly, but there are parts of the job that need to do IO, need to do some checking in, in the hierarchy management, the, the primary pod. So we don't expect it to to be pure linear. So what I've done here in, this, in these results is plot a couple of things. I plotted um, the speed up that you would expect if everything was linear, which is really just this line, the black line that you see here. Um, the next thing that we've added is a speed up, assuming you have a serial fraction of about 15%. That's something more attainable than pure linear, given the amount of file and networking I.O. that we need to do. And then what I did was um, plot our speed up in the blue curve for OPC runs that span 1,000 pods to 10,000 pods for a nano sheet node, which you can think of as three nanometers to two nanometers, depending on who you talk about or talk to for a, a back end um, wiring level. Back end wiring levels, and I apologize for using jargon, are are, are the, is the first wiring level that's most important for signals. And, and you know, the, they're called the thin wire levels, and there's a couple of them, but the first one is the most important. So what we're showing here is that with, in the blue curve, 
scaling from 1,000 to 10,000 pods, we're achieving a pretty close correlation with about a 15% IO um, uh, 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 or serial fraction, which is actually quite good. Um, we're by no means done with this. We believe that these points that you see here around six to 7,000 pods, we understand how to fix, and we think that we can definitely, with some very simple tweaks, start to increase the slope of this curve so that we're somewhere between the 15% serial fraction and the, the actual hypothetical linear scaling result. Um, so to summarize, we, we've successfully demonstrated running optical proximity correction at scale using a managed open shift service. Um, we're targeting management, managed open shift services because it minimizes setup and teardown in public cloud infrastructure. And we're applying what we've learned um, using optical proximity correction to many other tools in the design change, this uh, design tool chain. So we can apply this to the tools that we're actually using to do register transistor logic, synthesis, place and route, timing, and, and closure, um, and performance. Um, we've got a lot of opportunities to build logic and custom controllers in, into this flow. I, you know, we view this as, as the first step. Um, we do use, uh, for all of our mass delivery into Albany Nanotech today, um, OpenShift and, and, and a managed Kubernetes service. Um, so we're, in, in a sense, and this is something that we always have to do within IBM, our management team always insists that we eat our own cooking. So we can't go out and say, hey, everybody should use Kubernetes or everybody should use OpenShift. We actually have to do that and make sure that it works for us and that we can stand behind it and say, yep, here's the data. I can scale from 1,000 to 10,000 pods. I get good results. I can do this reliably. Um, and I think what this is also going to do is enable us to make smarter use of public cloud services, the IBM cloud in particular, but also not to limit ourselves to that. We're also a hybrid cloud company. We want to be able to enable this in, in other people's clouds so that we can make the greatest use of cloud resources and also deliver new technology on time. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, nice talk. Uh, I was curious, it sounds like you have a lot of like workflow management going on in, with this uh, workflow. Do you use any of the CNCF projects for uh, like Argo workflows or anything like that? Not yet. We, we would like to. Um, we started very simply because, um, you know, we, we had to solve some problems or, or some, some, I don't want to say problems. We had to optimize our containerization. Uh, flow, and in order to keep things simple on the compute side, we didn't we didn't try to do anything more sophisticated. That's one area where we'd like to go is is use, um, particularly on the operator side and the and the scheduling side, better uh, uh, um, or, or leverage open sh open source projects to actually do that better within within OpenShift and Kubernetes. J just want Thank to uh, add one more thing. So. Um, also, things like CRD changes, custom uh, uh, configuration on the node. So for that, uh, we are looking at Argo CD, things like that. When, whenever you have a job coming and you, before the infrastructure spin up, you have Argo CD comes in and uh, you know, prep the infrastructure. So things like that, you're looking at the Argo CD in, in that way. Thank you for the talk, very oh, inspiring. Uh, question, you've been at it for two years, which means you probably went to a number of OpenShift versions. I'm, I'm sorry, I, I'm hard you, of hearing. You've been doing this for two years. Yes. So you've probably been using several different OpenShift versions. Yes. What were your conclusions when upgrading? Did it really improve your performance or not? Um, I, I, can you repeat it one more time? I'm, I'm sorry. So you probably went from OpenShift 3 or maybe OpenShift 4, 1 to whatever, 10 yeah. or 11 or where you are to, to today. Right. I assume there would have been differences when you repeat the same tests with newer versions. Can you share something about that? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Um, we, we do see differences. Um, we, I, I, we've seen an improvement, um, it definitely in the four series of releases, um, in particular with, the, with our network performance and our ability to opt to tune file systems. Um, I, I think we need to be a little more rigorous about version control and how we benchmark different versions. We're not doing that today, but that's one of the things that's on our list. 
But I have seen some improvements definitely from three to four with networking and, and our file system performance and our ability to tune them. Um, the compute is also better, um, but I, I, you know, it's hard for me to quantify it because these workloads um, don't make very good use of hyperthreading. So when we, when we do position workloads, we're looking more for physical cores and trying to drive the workload to physical cores. Um, I think you know, we have some, some, some work to do to optimize it and make better use of, of, what, of what OpenShift offers and, and, and other you know, Kubernetes. Um, um. So, so j just to, uh, uh, one more thing. So OpenShift is 100% Kubernetes. We are also making improvement and upstream as well. So things like C then. C groups V2, these are coming, uh, f uh, going forward, which will enhance your performance. I mean, we have seen better results in, in the lab, and we are going forward uh, to implement this uh, within OpenShift as well. So going forward, you will see good, uh, I mean, I will working with Darren to see how the graph looks like when we implement those. Your slide listed GPFS and Ceph running with OpenShift, was that running in cluster or was that external? They are, so, so this is a managed service. They are running external. We're building them within the same VPC, but the control plane for the, the cluster is, is separate and it's different. So when we do the mounts, what we do is, is we're provisioning um, virtual machine nodes in the VPC and the control plane is managing all the connections. So if I understand your, your question as being external, the, the file systems are in the same, are, are in one of the data centers that the VPC in, in, encapsulates. The block storage that we're building it on is usually local. So we'll build it over local NVMe nodes or um, uh, bare metal or, or, or virtualized bare metal instances with local storage. So the, the operators aren't running in cluster in our, like Rooksef or using uh, CNSA for the GPFS layer? No, th okay. th these are you know, static per persistent volume claims that, that mount this, or, or the file system that we built within the custom and within the VPC. All right, with the, with, the, um, with the differences between Ceph and GPFS, did you see any performance differences in your workload? We did, so and, and it's really not a, it's not really a fair comparison. Ceph, Ceph performs much better than almost any of the other open source file systems that, that we've tried thus far. Um, and you know, it, it, truth in advertising, we haven't tried Luster yet, but you know, between Gluster, um, bare NFS built over block storage, Ceph outperforms them all. GPFS is really optimized for HPC. And it has some features that Ceph doesn't have, which allows it allows us to tune metadata and, and just performance um, in, in much more finely than we can with Ceph. Um, so GPFS will outperform Ceph. Um, but that being said, from an open source perspective, we're getting very good performance from Ceph. We still have a lot of work to do, but we're getting very good performance from Ceph. Uh, thank you, great talk. Uh, you mentioned that uh, for the Ceph, you have uh, the, there's something missing for the HPC. So I'm curious, what is your views that Ceph vis a vis HPC? I, I don't know that there's ne necessarily something missing from Ceph. We're using Ceph file system. GPFS is really, you, you, it's really kind of like a Ferrari. I, I mean, there are things that it does very, very well, and it's, and you can tune it to do certain things very well. So in some sense, it's, it, it's, not as, it's not a true apples to apples comparison. It's more, if, if I'm willing to go out and get spectrum scale, take the time to configure it, and, and there, there are managed services for GPFS today or spectrum scale. Um, but like any, anything else, you've gotta tune it. And so it just has more capability under the hood than Ceph does out of the box. And, and I think that's the main way to explain it. It's, it, and, and it, 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 it's often um, used in, in, in universities, national data centers. So there's, there's this entire body of work where people have figured out for this workload, here's how GPFS gets configured. So, so it's, it, 
I, I expect it to outperform Ceph um, out of the box. Now maybe there's somebody who's a Ceph better at Ceph than I am, who could get very close or beat GPFS. But you know, GPFS is really starting with a you know a huge arsenal ahead of time, a, a huge priority uh, uh, advantage. All right, thank you. Uh,